Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. By my reckoning, the 26th in our series, though I could well be wrong. Today we return back to the theme of COVID proteomics, the theme on which we started the series, and we look at some fresh research and ask, is COVID proteomics here to stay? We're joined by two new speakers, Dr. Well Kamel and David Roberts, alongside our guest chair for today, Professor, Sm Professor Marcus Ralser. Marcus will kindly chair the, guest, the question and answer session after both talks in a roundtable discussion with our speakers. So now I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before handing over to our guest chair to introduce the first speaker. As always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussion. Please join us there to ask questions and use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered. Please do direct your questions to each speaker by naming them as we'll be having a joint Q&A and roundtable discussion after both talks. For those needing an attendance certificate for this webinar, details will be available on how to get this after the last slide. Once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the BSPR, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, YPIC, and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, London Metabolomics Network, and the News and Proteomics Research Blog for promoting this event. We're also very grateful for Imperial College London's support for providing us with webinar support and help. And thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers. Our talk today will be available to watch again online. So, a huge thank you to the speakers and our guest chair for their time. But before Marcus introduces our speakers, a little note on our guest chair. Professor Marcus Ralser is the Einstein Professor of Biochemistry and Head of the Department of Biochemistry at Charité University Medicine in Berlin, Germany. He's also a senior group leader at the Francis Crick Institute here in London. The Ralser Lab is the recipient of substantial funding by the Crick, the Wellcome Trust, the ERC, EMBO, the BMBF, the Max Planck Society and the BBSRC. Marcus was selected into the EMBO Young Investigator Programme and he's also a Wellcome Trust Bait Fellow, as well as the recipient of a number of prestigious awards, too many to list here. His lab is known for fundamental discoveries that have improved our understanding of how cells can coordinate hundreds of biochemical reactions assembled in a metabolic, metabolic network and for the high development of high throughput mass spectrometry technologies. We've heard in previous sessions how we supplied those technologies to the discovery of clinical classifiers of COVID-19 infection, and we're very grateful that he's guest sharing our session today on COVID proteomics. Marcus, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Tom, for the overly kind introduction. But luckily, it's not about me today, but about two wonderful talks that we will hear in a section. Let me also just start by thanking everyone who attends this very exciting seminar series by, by Harry, uh, Tom, Daniel and the others who are organizing uh, this series and we all got used to those series and we love them and we want to keep them definitely beyond COVID and hopefully forever. Great, so my big pleasure is, um, I don't want to say too much, but let me introduce um, the first very exciting topic of today and it's presented by Well Kamen. He's a Marie Curie fellow and he spends his time both between the Castello lab at uh, Glasgow. Castello is known very much for his work on viral infection and viruses. So and uh, brings neatly together, and the Mohammed lab at Oxford, uh, which is a proteomics lab. And so therefore, I hope you will hear a lot of interesting combination of proteomics and transcriptomics today from Bell, and how this uh, helps to understand the viral infection process. So Bell, um, over to you. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the, our work here. Uh, so let me see if I can start uh, the presentation. Yeah, okay. So it's said uh, the talk is about RNA binding proteins on SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I would like to start from that slide. So it has been around a year and a half now since we started to hear about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And in the beginning, no one really expected that such a virus can cause this massive uh, effect, both in terms of spreading, as you can see, it spread everywhere, and also the fatalities. Up to now, we have 4 million deaths. This was, was not expected. And in order to deal with this, let's say, unknown threat or novel virus, we have to go back to the basics. So what is SARS-CoV-2? So SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. This is what we know, right? So what we know about RNA viruses? RNA viruses, usually they have a limited coding capacity. So the, the incoming viral RNA can only encode for little, for, for only a few proteins. So in case of SARS-CoV-2, it can only encode for 29 proteins, right? So these 29 proteins are definitely not enough to perform the whole virus life cycle. It's not enough. So the virus needs to hijack 
large number of cellular RNA, cellular proteins, right? So why do we need the cellular proteins? For example, it needs to translate. You have the translation of the incoming RNA. The virus needs to transcribe and replicate its own RNA. So you have the transcription replication, and then you have other processing events. In the same time, you have the cells will try to sense the intruder, and then you will have this antiviral protein that will come and sense that this not self uh, RNA. And the same time, the virus will try to recruit some proviral protein to counter the effect of this protein. So you have some antiviral and proviral uh, interaction happening at the same time. And if you look at this image, so what you can see, you see that there is a lot of cellular proteins which are binding to RNA, right? And that happened during the virus life cycle. So we can all agree that cellular RNA binding proteins are key players in virus infections. That, that's very well established. And the same most likely would be in case of SARS-CoV-2. So what we wanted to do, we and others, we wanted to develop a method that can capture these events. So we can, if we manage to capture the protein that binds to the viral RNA at different stages, translation, transcription, and so on, and then we, we identify this protein, we end up with the SARS-CoV-2 ribonucleic proteins complexes. That will give us idea how the virus life cycle is the same or different to the other viruses, and then we'll end up with a list with, with protein that in direct interaction with the viral RNA. So they are very interesting as an antiviral or proviral targets, right? So how did we do that? So our approach depends on the fact that the, how the cell and the virus make the RNA is different. So in case of the whole cell in mammalian cells, we have the RNA polymerase 2 in the nucleus, which is making the mRNA, right? And in the cytoplasm, we have the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase making the viral RNA. So what we did, we added a specific inhibitor. In this case, we added flavodrol and it's known to block the RNA polymerase too. So you'll have inhibition of the host transcription. And at the same time, we'll add a photoactive nucleotide, then we call it the, it's called 4SU, and then it will be incorporated in the nascent viral RNA, which is actively uh, transcribed because it's not affected by the inhibitor. And then we will do the labeling for, for a certain amount of time. So in case of SARS-CoV-2, we label for 16 hours. So it depends in your in your virus or live virus, uh, the virus life cycle. If the, the virus is replicating fast, then you have to label for short time. If the virus can stay for one day, then you can increase the labeling time. And then we cross-link a specific wavelength. So this is a 365. And the reason for a choice of this wavelength is because normal nucleotides, the, the normal RNA will not be uh, respond to these wavelengths. Only the, the modified nucleotide will get activated and will cross-link the protein bound to this RNA. So in this case, this, as you can see here, only the viral RNA, which will contain the 4 u will be cross-linked to the bound proteins, while cellular RNA, the one that's not labeled, will not be cross-linked, right? And then we do something called oligogeny capture. This is something uh, Castello have already uh, established in the lab. And the idea that you purify the uh, polyadenylated RNA using oligity uh, peats, right? And that's done under denaturating conditions. So we will purify both cellular and viral RNA, but only the viral RNA will be cross-linked to the bound proteins, right? And then we do RNA treatment and mass spec, so then we can identify the viral RNA bound proteome. So I will show you some of the control experiment that we did. As a proof of principle, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So the first thing that we wanted to, to establish is how the inhibitor, the flavobidrol, is affecting the host transcription. And for this, we use a cell line, which is a GFP under a doxycycline promoter. So you add the doxycycline, and then you get the induction of the GFP, right? So here you can see when you don't have the doxycycline and you don't have the inhibitor, this is the phase of uh, transcription from the from the GFP cassette. However, once you add the doxycycline, you get around the 34 increase in the GFP mRNA, so you have the induction. And then we test how the inhibitor will affect this strong transcription. So we add increasing concentration, and we see that at this effect, the 20 micromolar, we have very uh, strong inhibition. You turn back the transcription to the basal levels. So that, that, uh, um, that's just an indication how it affects on the host transcription. What we also did is that we um, yeah, so this is uh, this is silver staining. 
So we do the whole process, the on budget capture, and then the elements, instead of running the mass pick, we just run it on a normal gel and we do server staining. So in the first lane, So in the first lane, you don't add the, the forest use, so there is no, um, you don't add the forest use, so there will be no, no cross-linking and there is no inhibitor. So you see it's blank, so this is our negative control. Here when you add the photoreactive nucleotide, so we have the cross-linking, and then the, you will get the protein, a lot of protein bound to the cellular mRNA. However, when you have the, for the, uh, the modified nucleotide and the inhibitor, so the inhibitor will inhibit the incorporation of the forest use, so then it will look blank. So that will, this is a proof of principle that the inhibitor can inhibit the incorporation of the forest U into the cellular mRNA, and thus you will not get any of the bound proteins. And then most importantly, we wanted to see that these treatments that we do will not affect the viral protein production because we add in post flavon modified nucleotide. So we, in this experiment, we look at the nucleocapsid. This is one of the main viral proteins, SARS-CoV-2 viral proteins. And we add the first U and the flavo, and we take time points. And as you can see, plus or minus, you don't see any effect, any dramatic effect on the virus uh, replication. And this is a control. So it's based on this, we think that we have the optimal conditions to perform this approach, which we call viral RNA interactome capture. For short, it will be called VREC. So we went ahead and did the experiment in large scale. So we did it in Calus 3 cells. This is a lung uh, cancer cell line. We try to, to, to have the same physiological conditions as uh, um, what happened in nature. We have done the experiment in four replicates. We have two conditions. We have infected and non-infected, both in the presence of the modified nucleotide and in the transcription inhibitor. The principal component analysis show that the, uh, that the correlation between replicates is it's quite good. And then we did the statistical analysis. Yeah, so we managed to isolate around 130 uh, 39 RNA binding proteins. And when we look at the general composition of these proteins, we see that many of them have been already identified as a pro or antiviral proteins. And I'm just highlighting some of them in the volcano plot here. So that was the first step. The second step we wanted to do is we wanted to compare this SARS-CoV-2 RNA ribonucleic protein to another virus. So we selected SEMPIS. So SEMPIS is completely, it's belong to different families. So SEMPIS belong to alpha viruses, while SARS-CoV-2 belong to uh, coronaviruses. The sequence similarity is very low. And uh, also the, the main similarity between them actually is that both of them are actually polyandulated and capped. Other than that, they are really different. So we did the V rate also in SEMPIS, and what was what we saw is that so something very interesting. Let's just see it will come. Yeah. So here we have the enrichment, the source code to uh, look to uh, full change and for SEMPIS. And so in this in green, that would be the, the shared between them. And what was very surprising that 60% of the source code to rapid nuclear protein is also in SEMPIS. Let me just highlight it here. Just a second. Yeah, so we see 60 percent is shared between these two unrelated viruses. That would let us the idea that maybe we have this core riponuclear proteins which can be hijacked by different viruses and most likely they will perform a similar function. Right? So we started to focus on these core riponuclear proteins and wanted to know if they maybe would be important as a biological or biomedically relevant. So what we did, we did a small scale uh, drug screen, tried to find drugs that can inhibit this, some of these proteins. And I will show you some of these uh, uh, results. So yeah, so this is a drug screen. So in the X axis, we have the concentration of the drug. So it's increasing concentration of the drug. And on the y-axis, we can have the cell viability in black or the inhibition in red, right? So what we can see for these two inhibitors, the one that target the HO protein 90 and AMP inhibitor, these two in green, they have very strong effect on SARS-CoV-2 replication. And in these other two, they have also a moderate effect. Yeah, so this, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Also, this L1 and M MSI2, they also have a moderate effect. But it's very really surprising that the one in the common RMBs, they have the best in hepatic effect. And that again, emphasize the importance of the core ribonucleic proteins. So then what we also started to look deeper in these common uh, proteins, and we also found the complex. So this complex is uh, called tRNA ligase complex, and we find three of these uh, three components of this complex is binding to post SARS-CoV-2 and send this viral RNA. And this is the, uh, the component that we find, FAM98A, uh, RTCB, and DDX1. So what we know about tRNA ligase complex? tRNA ligase complex is involved in the splicing of small introns that you can find in tRNAs and some mRNAs. So after you have the cut of this small fragment, it's usually but it's, it's very small introns, so it's around 20, 25 nucleotides. So it's not a it's not a common intro. This is something very special uh, splicing, and it doesn't happen in the nucleus. It's happening in the cytoplasm near the ER. So you have that 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 you first you kick out this the intron, and then you have the, the ligase complex, which will ligate the zoo fragments. You can see here, and then you will get the maturation of the tRNA. So. But what is the link between the tRNA ligase complex and the virus infection? So why we see it in two different viruses? There is no splicing happening in uh, in cytoplasmic viruses. So why we see this one? And that's so the link between the tRNA ligase complex and the virus infection is really not well understood. So that was very interesting for us to to get to dig deeper into, right? So the first thing that we did, we we had two cell, two different cell lines. We have the A five four nine. With the AC2, this is for SARS-CoV-2, and we have the HEC293 for, for synthesis work, and we knock down to the X1, one of these components that we find. So what was very interesting for us that if we knock down to the X1, we see that the other components are significantly downregulated on the protein levels in two different cell lines. So if we send this the RNA samples for sequencing from the same knockdown, what we see is that we don't really get the same downregulation effect. So you see, FAM98 is not affected, RTCB is not affected. Here is, in case of HEC293, is slightly affected, but not as dramatically as what we see in the protein level, right? So that will suggest that, the, first of all, DDX1 is a core component of the complex. If you knock down the DDX1, the whole complex disappears. So that's its, that's which is its core component, and it most likely involved in stabilizing the complex through protein-protein interaction, something happening after the transcription of the, uh, the components. Right, so what else? So we wanted to see how the proteins change localization during infection. So first I'll start with the synthesis work. So here, you uh, so here uh, yes, this is uninfected cells, so there's no virus. You look at the distribution of the protein. So the DX1, it's more of diffused protein in the nucleus and the cytoplasm, very similar to the RTCP distribution. And then you put the virus, right? So 18 hours post-infection with synthesis, that's a bit late, uh, late infection. What we see here that if we look here, this is the synthesis capsid. So you see that there is a false sign. This is indicating virus replication factories. And then you see that the DDX1 started to have a very distinct false sign as well, right? And if you do the co-localization, you will see that it's co-localized with the synthesis capsid. So that it, it seems to be recruited where you have abundancy of the viral RNA which will fit with the results from the uh, viral RNA to, to capture. And the same thing that we see also with the RTCP, right? And we also have the FAM98, which show the same effect. So we wanted to see if we have the same result with SARS-CoV-2, right? So in case of SARS-CoV-2, we have the MOC cells, and here we're looking at the DDX1, right? So here, uh, uninfected cells, you have the normal distribution everywhere, it's diffused protein, and then you put the virus, you see that again, the false sign. Right? Here we're using double strand RNA as a marker for the uh, viral factories because usually the viruses are produced as double stranded. You have the minus strand and plus strand. So then when you have looking at the co-localization, you have very nice co-localization, which you can see also here in the configuration. So that will indicate that post, in both cases, in synthesis and in SARS-CoV-2, it seems that the tRNA ligase complex is changing localization to go where you have the viral RNA right? in post viruses. So that was something very interesting. So what we also did, we did, um, yeah. So we did the knockdown for the DDX1 and we looked at for the nuclear capsid, SARS-CoV-2 nuclear capsid. And what we can see that the SARS-CoV-2 nuclear capsid basically dramatically downgraded once you started to deplete uh, 
the tRNA ligase complex. So that would also indicate that it's important for virus infection, right? So we wanted to dig deeper in this phenotype. So here we did uh, an RNA-seq experiment in post cell lines, HIC293 and A549, using the two different viruses, Simpis and SARS-CoV-2. And we're comparing the knockdown of DDX1 versus the control, right? So basically this plot in the in the x-axis, you have the mean expression that will tell you the abundance of the RNA. And in the y-axis, you have the fold change. So if you have down regulation, you will see it here. You have up regulation, you will see it here. So in blue, that will be the DDX1 RNA. So it's expected when you knock down DDX1, it will be the most down regulated gene. That's expected, you see that in post cell line. But what was very surprising, you see that what is the most Upon, uh, so the most abundant RNA is usually the viral RNA in both cases. But what was very cool that we see that it's it's also the most RNA down regulated by DDX1 uh, lockdown. So you see it's almost the same level of the, as the DDX1 RNA when you get the down regulation. So that's to indicate that you have direct interaction between DDX1 and the viral RNA. If, if the DDX1 go down, the viral RNA will also go down in the same levels. Right, so we wanted to see a bit deeper what's happening to the viral RNA. Right. So let me just give a bit, a little bit background about how that viral replication takes place. So in post cases in Simpson and SARS-CoV-2, we have the incoming RNA, which we call it a positive strand. Right, so this is a strand that can be translated. That's why we call it a positive strand. So you have the positive strand, which you then will make a negative strand. So the negative strand is not translated. It only acts as a template for replication, for viral replication. So it will just make a positive strand. What was very unique in, in case of synthesis, this negative strand only happened since the negative strand since only happened for the first few hours, maybe two to three hours post infection, and then it stops. And then the whole replication completely changed, and you start to only produce a positive strand, right? So here we wanted to see if the effect that we see on the viral RNA will be in post cases or not. So in case of synthesis, you see the down regulate when you have the no down DDX1 you get this tenfold down regulation of the positive strain accumulation, and in the same you see in the negative strain. So that will indicate the effect of DDX1 happening in the early phase of infection. So during these two, three hours in uh, post-infection, DDX1 is required during the initial stages of the viral replication. And the same thing that we see also in SARS-CoV-2. So it's seen that, so that the idea that we, from this part, what we know that we know it's important during the early phase of infection. So we also look deeper. So one of yeah, so it affects viral RNA replication most likely during the early phase. We wanted to see what kind of viral protein interact with the tRNA ligase complex. So we purify one of these components. So here we have the enrichment of the GFP tag uh, FM98 over the GFP, and we can see that it binds to the other component of the tRNA ligase complex. But we also purify four of the viral proteins. This is the case of synthesis NSP1 to three and the capsids. But you need to be a bit cautious when you, when you look at the viral protein because usually they are produced in a massive amount. So we wanted to normalize uh, this uh, enrichment over their abundance in the total proteome. And among these proteins, we get the NSP1 to be highly enriched in the tRNA ligase complex during infection. So what is the NSP1? NSP1 is a viral cap enzyme. So it's very important to add the cap to the viral RNA, so in order to be stabilized and also to be translated, right? So it's a very essential bar, it's a very essential protein, and we see that the tRNA ligase complex is directly interacting with this protein, right? So what, what this was very interesting finding because when you look in the literature, what we found is that DDX1, which is a, a, the component of the tRNA ligase complex, is interacting with SP, NSP14 in different coronaviruses. NSP14 is the cap, also the capping enzyme for coronavirus. So it seems that even if you have, so you have, so the, the homology between NSP14 and NSP1, NSP14 and SARS-CoV-2 and NSP1 in Simbis is very low, but you have the same complex interacting with both. So that's mean that you have a different virus and, and it hijacked the same complex, probably for the same function. And this is something that we are currently working on. And there is a PG student, just that's her project basically. So in, in order to summarize, so we have established this um, approach, we call it viral RNA capture. We show that this approach can be used with different viruses, 
And also we show that if you set up something in the in the in a model virus, which in samples can be easily translated to something unknown like SARS-CoV-2, and it can and this approach can identify the protein which are in direct contact with the viral RNA. We show that different viruses have are hijacking similar complexes, and most likely this complex will be essential for virus replication. And if we started to target these common complexes, we see a very strong effect on viral fitness. And finally, we propose that the tRNA ligase complex is one of these complexes, and it seemed to be a master regulator of infection, which is something that we will uh, currently be working on to understand more. So I just want to end up with the acknowledgement slide. This work has been involving so many different labs. So from Oxford, so we were initially in Oxford, and then we moved to Glasgow. Shabazz, Mohammed Shabazz, which Mohammed Shabazz and Alfredo D orchestrated all this collaboration. Davis Lab in, uh, in Oxford, and from Cambridge Ladies Lab for help in proteomics. And Heidelberg, they helped us with the infection studies with SARS-CoV-2. And I would like to acknowledge especially Marco and Berati, who did all the uh, in infection with SARS-CoV-2. And thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Thank you well for a very nice presentation, a very highly interesting result. Um, so for just for everyone housekeeping, we will have the discussion afterwards um, after the second presentation. So hold your breath a little bit about what you want to ask well, but you can use already the, the comment function in the in the Slack channel, please, and to add the questions that you might have. And uh, before that, um, it's a big pleasure for me uh, to introduce the second speaker of today, and this is David Roberts. Um, David Roberts is a grad student at the University of Medicine in Wisconsin, and he works together with uh, Ying Ji and Sang Yin and works on top-down proteomics. That's something that excites many of us, but not everyone is doing this, and he will explain us a little bit differences he saw in the glycoform heterogeneity of the spike receptor protein, and we're all very curious to hear about the latest results. Hello, can you hear me? Good. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk. It's a wonderful opportunity and I really appreciate it. So uh, thank you again, Marcus, and the rest of the uh, London Proteomics Discussions Group. Uh, so today I'm going to be giving a talk uh, discussing a recent work that I had uh, been doing on uh, SARS-CoV-2. I think uh, Whale gave a wonderful introduction. So instead of introducing the concept again, I'm going to focus more so on like sort of the unique aspects of what I'm doing. And um, in particular, you'll find that uh, the way that uh, our group and, and, and me specifically approach this is coming specifically from mostly just the proteomic side. And so to give a little bit of a brief introduction, so here at the GUG group at UW-Madison, we focus on what we like to describe as transdisciplinary research, combining many different areas of science, chemistry, biology, medicine, to target uh, systems biology uh, questions specifically related to the heart and more recently related to things that could be influenced by uh, comorbidities of the heart, such as SARS-CoV-2. But the unique angle that we take is that we approach all of these things through uh, top-down mass spectrometry in particular. And to give a little bit of an idea of what I mean by that, uh, I think we'll all remember the central dogma of biology. DNA goes to mRNA, goes to proteins. Here I'm presenting a little bit of a slight uh, nuanced view of that. So DNA going into mRNA, going into what is called proteoforms. Now this is essentially the collection of all protein groups uh, that can arise from a single gene and counting for any of the mutations, possible alternative splicings, and any other sorts of changes that can occur at the genomic or transcriptomics level, and also encapsulating all of the possible post-translational modifications that can occur at this functional level of a protein. And you can see that as we go in the information cascade <clears throat> from the genome to the transcriptome to the proteome, <clears throat> there is indeed what it seems to be like an exponential increase at the complexity and level of information. And in fact, this is uh, for the most part the case. If we remember tw about 20 years ago when the Human Genome Project was first uh, finally established, we believed that we had everything solved at the time. But it turns out that life indeed is more complex than we might have thought. And in fact, uh, 
proteome complexity. And I hope to convince you today that at the protein level, the functional unit of biology, this is where a lot of the interesting things tend to happen and where we need to start understanding uh, and reckoning some of the uh, kind of diversity of features that we can achieve by having all of these uh, biological events occur and forming all of these various kind of diverse uh, protein structures all arising from the same gene. And so what's really unique here is that we need new technologies to analyze these uh, changes at the functional level and especially with molecular resolution to understand sort of these modifications in tandem with the protein change. And um, in fact, the thing that the technique that we use and the technique that uh, is becoming more of the premier disruptive technology to look at this is top down mass spectrometry, which looks at the intact protein. And so uh, I mentioned post translational modifications. Well, the focus of today is SARS CoV 2. And in fact, uh, some of the interesting things that we have found about this protein over time is when you compare the novel coronavirus 2019 with the earlier 2002 SARS, you'll actually see just from a sequence level at the amino acid sequence level, there's a lot of homology between these two things, which is not very surprising. They're both coronaviruses. However, what seems to be uh, not so obvious is that the structural analysis or the association between the SARS-CoV-2 uh, regional binding domain, which interacts with the host's ACE2 cell, seems to be governed by what people believe potentially could be influenced by post-translational modifications. And so uh, earlier in 2020, uh, Max Crispin's group did wonderful work on trying to establish some of the uh, reasons why PTMs may be influencing uh, SARS-CoV-2 structure. And in particular, they focused on uh, the S protein and looking into some of the uh, modifications that are possible. And as with many viruses, it seems that glycans and sugar modifications essentially dominate a lot of the biology and a lot of the post-translational modifications that govern these proteins. And so just from the image here, you can see all of this uh, little multicolored map showing color spreads of different glycans. And this is just the oligomannose content not even including some of the other complications that could arrive. And even more recently, uh, Romar's group at UC San Diego had shown with molecular modeling that if you just account for all of the glycans on top of some of the structures that we have achieved so far for these proteins, you can see it almost looks like a jungle. It's really a mess. All of this blue shaded area here represents glycans kind of coating the surface of these proteins. And so we can really begin to appreciate that post-translational modifications, glycan specifically, are indeed very important potentially for these viral receptor interactions. And so this is not a surprise because uh, classically viral biology tends to be heavily regulated uh, functionally through glycosylation, ranging from attachment and entry, adaptive immunity, spread innate immunity, assembly and exit. So these sugars, these post-translational modifications that appear on the surface of these uh, viral proteins tend to influence a lot, not only on the immunogenic uh, side, which is our own recognition of it, but also on its ability to potentially change, evolve, and become more virally fit over time by just modifying its surface uh, post-translational modifications. And so this presents both sort of an interesting opportunity to think about the molecular reasons why this is the case, but also uh, poses a huge challenge on us to solve and sort of try to understand some of this complexity. And in particular, another recent work that really tries to like write home the message here is that, uh, and this comes from Lance Wood's group, glycans seem to critically influence the viral receptor interactions of this ACE2 sort of S protein uh, formation. And so here, are these are just molecular models that uh, show some of the interactions that could potentially happen between the trimer spike and soluble ACE2 portion. And what's very interesting that was found here is that it seems that the glycans of both of these proteins also interact along with the protein surfaces themselves. So the accessible epitope of the S protein in conjunction with ACE2 are also potentially governed by some of the glycan interactions between them. And so, this sort of really underscores the need to understand or molecularly characterize the glycan structures, not only for SARS-CoV-2 as we currently understand it, but as we've come to know through all the variations and mutations that can be possible, the new and arising and emerging strains that can be happening.
it becomes even more critically important to begin to lay out the molecular uh, sort of view of what's happening so that we can better understand this and better develop therapeutics to be able to rationally treat this uh, quickly. And so that's where I see this as both sort of the motivation and some of the opportunities to be able to think about this problem in a different way. So we understand that protein post translational modifications heavily implicated in the structure function of SARS-CoV-2. And we now seem to have more of a reckoning as with other coronaviruses in the past, such as HIV and so on, that it's crucial to begin to understand how these modifications play a role because they can maybe potentially help us to enhance our understanding and develop better therapeutics. But um, along with this, actually a kind of unique challenge and interesting caveat is, uh, although we have some nice structures right now for these proteins, traditional structural methods such as X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM are helpful, but not comprehensively able to characterize glycoproteins. And this is really due to the inherent flexibility and heterogeneity of these sugars. They're just kind of wobbling on the surface of these proteins and they're just not going to stay still no matter what. And so what uh, we do here in the GUG group and what I've been thinking about and looking into for this recently is how we can apply top-down mass spectrometry, which is capable of analyzing things at this sort of intact protein level to provide maybe new proteoform resolved is what I like to call it and structurally detailed answers to some of these significant questions. And this is not uh, something that's uh, too far-fetched. Uh, in fact, uh, I like to call it, and a lot of members in the group like to call it, uh, the top-down uh, mass spectrometry can potentially enable what we call a bird's eye view, sort of like a you know sky-high view of complex proteins. And uh, we've shown this recently, actually, with a work uh, that I've done with my colleague, uh, Tim Tianbang, that top-down mass spectrometry can provide sort of this uh, holistic view of diverse structural changes in proteins. And this is an example of the various modifications that can occur in an important gold standard biomarker for heart disease, cardiac troponin I, as you go between different levels of cardiac pathophysiology from a healthy donor to all the way to a completely deceased postmortem heart. You can see that although the protein itself is the same, the protein forms change dramatically. And this may be indicative of potential onset of, of cardiac failure or, or the risk of a heart attack. And we are currently exploring this to better understand it. But I hope you can see that even from this example, the diversity at the protein level is really tremendous. And if we can harness technologies that can really elucidate these things, perhaps we can gain new molecular understandings for COVID. And that's exactly what this uh, work that I'm speaking about now tends, tries to do. So. As we know, SARS-CoV-2, the viral uh, structure itself is relatively large, but it's really just made up of RNA and protein. And really at the surface level where the recognition takes place in the body, it's the S protein and specifically the regional binding domain of that S protein that does the uh, specific interaction with the host receptor ACE2. And so here we tried to take uh, a kind of a hybrid view to look at this thing from an intact protein point of view. You see, conventional methods that tend to look at glycoproteins often do this from a bottom-up, triptychally digested uh, approach where you analyze the glycopeptides or the resulting glycans separately from the protein. And while that's really good for a high-throughput uh, view of the glycans that are possible potentially and some of the glycosides, you really lose sort of the critical information that could only be obtained when you have all of that structural detail intact in one place. And so kind of avoiding this peptide to protein inference problem, if you look at this from the top down point of view, you can maybe achieve some of these new and emergent uh, complexity. And so what we try to do here is essentially simultaneously characterize the regional binding domain through a combined native. So this is a non-denaturing uh, approach where you try to maintain as much of the structural tertiary aspects of this protein in the gas phase and through a high resolution or should I, I should really just say ultra high resolution view where we characterize every single proteoform, every single modification uh, of this protein at the same time. And to do this, we, we used a technique called uh, TIMS, Trapped Ion Mobility Spectrometry. Uh, this is uh, done through an instrument called Timstoff Pro, which was recently released by Brooker, and we were fortunate enough to be able to have one um, in our hands, and a 12 Tesla Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. 
Uh, so this kind of dual combination, we hope, can maybe help to peer into some of this complexity. And uh, so that's kind of better elaborated here in this next slide, where I kind of give you a little bit of a view of what I mean by this. So essentially, in terms of workflow, what we do is we take the spike regional binding domain recombinants and we perform a direct ionization electrospray uh, into either this uh, Timstoff, as we talked about, which is a trapped ion mobility instrument. So it's capable of ion mobility at the front end, followed by uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, separately, we can also look at it through this uh, Fourier transform ion cyclotron, so FTICR mass spectrometer. It's 12 Tesla and it's uh, extremely ultra high in extremely, res uh, extremely high resolving power. Uh, and this is really nice because we can get uh, isotopic baseline isotopic resolution to really accurately determine the modifications. And so <clears throat> using this intact protein approach, we can basically select for all of the molecular forms, all the molecular species of this protein in one single uh, uh, run and be able to sort of try to understand some of the complexity that can arise from this thing. And so one thing I would like to say here is that uh, specifically, uh, and this is going back to some of the work that's been applied before, we've already seen a lot of cases where people have tried to understand uh, SARS from the point of view of glycans, but uh, more particularly, it has remained to be seen what some of the uh, O-glycoforms of the mucinome side of this protein could be. And so instead of focusing on the N-glycans, which tend to be quite complex and very difficult to resolve, um, we tried to take a different approach to focus on looking at the O-glycoform side. And, and so, as you can see demonstrated in this particular figure, uh, before and after uh, N-glycan removal using uh, enzyme uh, PNGase F, so we did a native en en enzymatic removal of uh, the N-glycans, this represents about a 10 kilodalton loss in molecular weight, which really highlights some of the complexity. And in fact, the, the branching of these uh, N-glycans, as, as people have found, tends to be extremely uh, uh, of the complex variant side. So a lot of like multiple co uh, large core structures from the N-glycan world. And this actually leads to a very difficult to resolve uh, protein structure, even by some of the best methods that we have on our hands. But after you incubate with ping is F and remove a lot of these N-glycan interference, you can actually reduce the structural complexity so that you could begin to access some new resolved features. And you can start to see here, just with these charge states labeled, some of the appearance of the molecular forms of the SRBD after the fact. And what's nice here is that uh, fortunately, essentially, although with the entire glycan uh, structure intact, you get sort of a very difficult mess to deal with, if you just simplify it and look and focus only on the O glycoform side, you get what seems to be a very nicely resolved spectra. And so this is sort of like a, a fortunate thing for us, but also what's really nice now is that we can apply a lot of these techniques that we have to uh, look at this protein in more detail. Um, and we began by first looking at it through a native uh, top-down approach. So what we call a native trapped ion mobility uh, mass spectrometry approach. And What's nice here is that uh, when you're taking uh, a native approach, you get to focus not only on the protein with all of its fixings in place, but also you get to understand a little bit of some of the non-covalent interactions that might be possible so long as you can maintain sort of a sufficiently soft um, ionization scheme in the gas phase. And what was a little bit unusual, but something that we've um, kind of vetted extensively and it seems to also agree with orthogonal analysis that we've done using native page and other techniques, that the SRBD in solution seems to also form uh, native dimers. And, and this is relatively invariant to a concentration screening and uh, some other solvent choice or buffer selections that we've done. And this is quite interesting because uh, this is something that um, other researchers have found uh, to potentially may be the case. Uh, turns out when you infect uh, cells, with uh, COVID, if you look at the uh, supernatant of some of this, and I believe there's a work uh, from Oxford about this, uh, there is what seems to be free S protein that leaches out from cells after COVID infection. And potentially understanding why this uh, is important, it maybe also 
uh, if we can discover some native dimerization at the regional binding domain level, perhaps that might imply something from the whole spike level. Uh, but here, first, after resolving this uh, protein through native TIMS, we can then look into a lot of the structural or the glycoform heterogeneity using this ion mobility approach. So what's nice about trapped ion mobility, similar to other drift tube uh, uh, sort of uh, mass spectrometry uh, ion mobility techniques, is you can separate uh, ions in the gas phase by their intrinsic mobility. And in particular, what I'm showing here is sort of the separation of this native uh, SRBD um, through uh, ion mobility. So this is plotted as an inverse uh, uh, mobility. This is just a convention with uh, trapped ion mobility spectrometry. But what you might notice here are these two distinct features that I've come to label as region one and region two. These actually distinctly correspond to both uh, the uh, 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 the uh, RBD both as from the monomeric state and the RBD as a dimeric state as shown here. And what's interesting is if you look into so, uh, the, the collision cross-section of these ions, which is essentially the apparent size that these ions can occupy uh, in space, you actually notice that there is a, a commensurate increase in both the collision cross-section and as well as the broadening of the peaks, which shows you that uh, these uh, dimeric forms seem to uh, almost double in the uh, uh, in the heterogeneity, which is to be expected if there are D dimers. Um, and what's interesting here is that we can also uh, annotate sort of like understand like a uh, charge state specifically every single uh, uh, all the collision cross section uh, values associated with each of these different uh, charged forms. And when you plot them, they essentially follow the linear trace very, very nice, which is what we'd expect from uh, at a complex. But uh, so what this enables us to do is start to look at sort of the conformational heterogeneity of this protein species. And it's really nice to be able to do these sort of analysis because potentially in the future, this might allow us to look into non-covalent interactors, not only from mass spectrometry, but also from an ion mobility point of view, you could imagine if you uh, toss in some binder or something of interest that may be sticking to this thing in, 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 in uh, native state, perhaps that might also reflect some change in the ion mobility. And uh, people like Professor Carol Robinson and uh, Vicky Wysowski have uh, done very good jobs to show this for other cases in native mass spectrometry. Um, and kind of building off of that uh, previous uh, slide, what you saw was that you could separate out some of the molecular forms of this protein in its native state, but we can take that a step further essentially and not only start to separate out the native forms to understand maybe the structural heterogeneity, but we can perform kind of more traditional MSMS analysis to understand the sequence and understand maybe some of the glycan structures. And so taking again a native TIMS approach, we can actually take advantage of the fact that we can manipulate the ion mobility of this species to kind of select not only from the quadrupole isolation, but from the ion mobility isolation and combine this to generate uh, kind of a really nice uh, slew of native fragment ions that we can begin to analyze. And in this uh, particular feature here, you're just seeing some representative examples that we were able to find uh, when going through this uh, protein in detail one by one. And you can see here some of the interesting oak like core structures that we can potentially find. And what's interesting also, even from just this preliminary analysis, all of the oglycosites that we were able to see corresponding to these glycan structures actually only arised from a single uh, glycoside. This is the theranine 323, uh, I believe. And this is uh, pretty powerful because not only do we capture the intact protein, but we can further isolate to very specifically annotate what these modifications are. And so we have very high levels of confidence that we can not only detect the the precursor form, but also the molecular form after the fact. So any of the structures that branch from it. Um, and what's really cool and kind of plays into some of the uh, the, the data I showed uh, from the re previous slide is we can take advantage of uh, Tim's to also start to understand some of the uh, conformational heterogeneity that's possible uh, from different glycan structures. So not only can we investigate the glycan structure types or even separate the proteins themselves in ion mobility space, 
but there is a chance that modifications themselves may be more indicative or maybe would influence the intrinsic um, ability of this protein and the various glycoforms that are possible into different spaces in eye mobility. And so if we can find unique ways to separate this in eye mobility space, that might also give us some information of some of the structural changes that are possible. And you could imagine that between various uh, core glycan structures, or maybe even between various uh, mutants or changes or strains of COVID, perhaps this information can maybe become more diagnostic if we if it's indeed something that's uh, truly reflective of the of the structure of features. And even here in a case uh, where we have uh, the non glycosylated, so this is the uh, uh, high high resolution crystal structure that's so far generated for the non glycosylated uh, SRBD, it has a uh, collision cross-section roughly about 2.18 uh, kilo angstroms squared. But if you look at it compared to some of the very branched extended uh, O-glycan structures like this uh, uh, core two structure here, you see that it's showing like roughly about a 60 uh, angstrom squared increase in the collision cross-section. And so this is pretty exciting to see because this maybe implies that there is an ability to connect between specific O-glycoforms and their gas phase structural endogeneity which could potentially provide us deeper insights into some of the structural diversity from these complex uh, oglycans. Um, and although from a native perspective, this information is very valuable, one of the shortcomings, if we were to just stop here, is that the SRBD itself contains a lot of disulfides and it's really difficult to sort of uh, comprehensively uh, get a really deep sequence coverage for this thing in the native state. And, and so what we did, and, and part of the reason this is sort of a hybrid approach, is we took it to uh, sort of a denatured mode where we're better able to uh, sequence all of the specific uh, uh, areas of interest of this protein. And I, I think this is a very cool application of top-down mass spectrometry. So uh, the way I'm going to show this is kind of uh, in steps. And so in the beginning here is uh, sort of the uh, denatured structure of the SRBD post PNGSF treatment. So this is the sort of o and retained version of the S protein. You can see here that all of these uh, peaks represent different charge states. And uh, what's impressive here, this is using the 12 Tesla FTICR MS, is that it's completely baseline resolved. So all of these molecular ion forms are sort of completely baseline resolved. And if you zoom in on a particular charge state, <clears throat> you can look at all of the molecular signatures of this protein kind of at the same time. And this is a very powerful way to view sort of the inherent complexity that's possible. So what's what I think is sort of the really cool thing about this intact uh, protein approach is there's sort of everything is in your view at the same time. If you look at biology just from what's possible, you'll see that sometimes there's like hundreds, maybe thousands of modifications all possible. But what's really nice about top down is that you get to collapse all of that complexity into something you can see. So you get to see all of the molecular forms in its most abundance and, and, in, and in the true stoichiometry that it exists in. So we don't stop here. Now that we can do something like this, we can actually now start to iterate sort of a really cool application of intact protein mass spectrometry, which is you are able to isolate not just uh, specific precursor ions, but those precursor ions can be uh, pretty much intact proteoforms. So if you were to choose your selection window cleverly, you can isolate individual proteoforms, fragment them, and be able to generate sort of a slew of uh, structural annotations um, front to back for each of these forms. And here's such an example of something like that. So this is a much more involved sample than usual, but you can even see here in this core two fucosylated oglycan structure, bearing an N-terminal acetylation on the protein sequence, you can actually go uh, point for point, varying from soft ionizations to maintain the uh, intact glycan form in its entirety, and then kind of ramp up over time and combine various forms of collisional and electron uh, capture association uh, techniques to break this apart into its various fragment ions and be able to sequence those fragment ions. And so this is something that's like very powerful because uh, oftentimes what you might find from a bottom-up approach, especially when you're dealing with glycopeptides, is 
the collision energy or the activation energy may not necessarily always be the softest that you need to be able to see the intact form. Sometimes during the modification or the generation of the glycan uh, peptides, you can maybe potentially modify or change some of the glycan structures that are particularly labile. But here from this top-down approach, you get to kind of be as soft as you can be, preserve as much of that intact structure as possible and be able to sequence them and you might be surprised because some of these uh, individual fragment forms can be isotopic to some other forms that might exist um, just in the uh, in solution. And so with this uh, approach, we can kind of uh, go through this, iterate this process and could generate what uh, I call sort of the complete characterization of the structures and molecular abundances. And so here is sort of a bird's eye <laughs> view of all the glycoforms and sort of uh, what this allows us to do, not just the fact that we can have baseline isotopic resolution, so the accuracy of our uh, measurements is rather, is rather high, but also, as you can see here, we can actually simultaneously quantify all the molecular abundances and the stoichiometries of these glycan forms. And that's really nice, and it's sort of summarized here, but um, in an interesting fashion, sort of, you can actually see that from the SRBD point of view, at least in the recombinant case that we dealt with here, expressed from hex cells, this uh, protein seems to have roughly like a 67 to 27 ratio of core one to core two glycan abundances. And uh, it's really powerful to be able to say this. And in fact, one glycan form in particular, this sort of gal net gal uh, uh, double salic acid motif, this core one motif, represents about 65% of the total molecular abundance of this protein. And so this is sort of something that uh, it is capturable from a bottom-up point of view, but, but really to be able to see all of the molecular stoichiometry at the same time in the intact state is extremely powerful. And so you can even begin to think, well, if, this are, if these represent sort of the most abundant forms of this protein, can that now inform us to make better choices for therapeutic design? Or maybe can we even think about glycan-specific ways to assay uh, these targets, or even can we start doing this approach uh, and sort of iterate this for other variants of SARS-CoV-2? Maybe we'll see different uh, molecular forms. Maybe that'll be indicative of something that we can take advantage of from a chemical, biochemical point of view that can help to maybe motivate new solutions that we can take to addressing this challenge. And so just showing sort of uh, in close some of the nice things that you can do in this particular work, we were able to identify um, uh, all of these different glycoforms in tandem and using this kind of combined native top-down and uh, denaturing top-down approach, uh, we are able to find and kind of map out the structural heterogeneity but also uh, understand all of the molecular forms uh, and be able to sequence them and site specifically understand them. And in fact, to give you an example of some of the, uh, this, this, this figure itself probably is a good example of that, is the microheterogeneity of O-glycans is uh, pretty immense. So this is the variety of different glycan structures that can exist at a single site. It turns out all of these different forms, um, at least in our hands from this sample, actually all correspond to a single theronine 323 glycoside on the uh, SRBD, um, which is uh, interesting and uh, a little bit tricky because if all such diversity is possible at a single site, you know, when you're thinking about this thing uh, as an intact trimer, uh, you can only imagine what kind of complexity we're wrangling between different forms of this. But uh, I hope what's uh, nice to see here is that this could potentially this, this top-down view can potentially serve as sort of what I like to call a powerful approach to comprehensively analyze the molecular signatures of this and potentially other emerging variants of SARS-CoV-2 uh, moving forward and can, and can I, I think, certainly help to provide some molecular understanding and maybe even show some unique ways to take advantage of structure function uh, uh, studies with uh, complementary top-down analysis. And so uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge both of my groups. Uh, so I'm actually uh, jointly mentored by both uh, professors uh, Sao Jin and Yinga here at UW-Madison. So uh, my advisors, uh, 
I like take good care of me and I'm really thankful for them. So being a member of two different groups is sort of being a member of a very large family. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I also like to thank our collaborators. So a lot of these, uh, especially Dr. Alan Brazer helps out a lot uh, with uh, the virology aspects and especially our collaborators at Brooker. And I'd like to thank uh, the American Heart Association for providing me a predoctoral fellowship and uh, the National Institute of Health, Brooker and the Department of Chemistry here at UW-Madison. Um, I'm very happy to take any further questions as we move into the roundtable discussion. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for the fantastic opportunity and for the great session. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Mel, for two very, very exciting uh, presentations. And so um, we have a few questions in the chat and there is a few other things. So people, please still feel motivated to put on new questions to the two exciting talks. And let me start with a question to both speakers, which connects a little bit um, the two talks. So obviously um, the glycosylation is performed by the host proteome you know, of the cell that is infected. And the question to Val is, have, have you seen any, and a lot of the old glycosylation machinery, of course, is localized. It's as far as I remember, mostly in the ecology, and it sometimes even starts co-transcriptionally. So the question is, um, well, did you see any evidence for the pathways? Uh, is there anything specific involved in SARS-CoV-2? And question to David, could you exploit any of those uh, to affect the maturation of the receptor binding domain? Um, so if I can just start, so it's not the glycosylation, we did see that, so we, in, in the paper, we did also a different assay from the one that I was talking about. We also did something called uh, comparative RNA interleukin capture, and that will measure the general RNA, RNA binding activity for the proteins. And we found there is a correlation between the phosphorylation of the proteins and RNA binding activity. There was a trend that uh, increase in phosphorylation will correlate with increase in RNA binding activity, but this, this is not for every protein. There is some examples for this. So it's definitely uh, PTMs is play a big part in uh, regulating the RNA binding activity and that will uh, change localization or uh, the activity and function as well. And this is something that the virus known to hijack and manipulate. So back to David, if you want to add something? Oh, I, I thought that was a, a fantastic question. I, actually, it, it was a similar question I, I was having for you, Whale. I was really curious if like uh, some of the studies you see seem to uh, uh, preferentially influence the PTMs downstream, like at different stages of the life cycle. Um, uh, Marcus, could you repeat the question for for me uh, again? So, well, the question is a little bit related to which extent you think that differential O glycosylation is important for the virulence of SARS-CoV-2 and the infection cycle. And so, the uh, one question is, could you then manipulate, you know, um, some of those pathways in order to affect the virulence? Yes. Yes. Um, so. Um, you see, this is actually sort of a, a, a blessing and a curse for uh, the mucinome or O-glycosylation study. Uh, it, it's really difficult compared with N-glycosylation tools that we have to sort of specifically address um, structure function specific questions solely due to O-glycans. And uh, it, it's something that still um, people are trying. They're doing sort of in vitro assays where they try to clip off certain portions of N glycans and see if that changes some of the binding interactions from O glycosylation world. Um, it's a little bit uh, tricky to really do, uh, but to give some idea that there are other viruses in the past that do show silic acid or neuromic acid interactions, for example, which is a common motif of both N and O glycans to influence viral function. From the O glycosylation world, uh, it's predicted that it potentially may be, but it also depends potentially on the specific form of the S protein that's present. People have been finding that different forms of the S protein from different uh, preparations, either the trimer itself or even the single protein, or even between different variants can present uh, with different diversity of glycoforms. And so it's it's a, a very interesting question to tackle, but where there's not a complete knowledge base right now of understanding that. But to more specifically address the second part of your question, can we manipulate this and maybe do something interesting with it? That's actually something that I'm, I'm currently looking into right now, actually with uh, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Alan Brazer's group here at UW-Madison. 
we're looking into we're generating lentiviral models where we specifically change uh, air, glycosylation areas on the SRB or even H2 and trying to use top-down mass spectrometry to gain some structural insights to how these associations might change. So if specific glycan forms are more important than others, then we can kind of molecularly quantify the stoichiometry with top-down and then uh, do these sort of different uh, functional assays to understand how they might play a role in the binding. So I, I think it's a great question, and I'd say stay tuned as, as we and others learn more about this. Great, thanks. So, so let me follow then with, with a question to Ben. Let's swap a little bit topic. So, uh, so the viral RNA capture method uh, that Alfredo has initially started and it's, it's really cool and it solves a, a problem that people have been struggling, you know, for a long time. How can you isolate uh, specific RNAs out of uh, out of a cell without having a, a probably a sequence specific probe uh, to do that? And at the same time, of course, uh, because it's not easy, it's also a complicated method. No, you need to inhibit the transcription of the whole cell. You need to then um, you V irradiate. You need to fix it, and so this makes the whole thing a little bit static and perhaps also a bit influenced by um, the environmental condition imposed. So can you comment a little bit, where is the direction going? Is there a way to make this simpler, to make it more dynamic? Um, so, so what can people do in the future uh, with viral RNA capture methods? Yeah, so I think the main worry when we started to do this method is that we were afraid that we can affect the virus life cycle by adding the inhibitor, the first U, and so on, like you mentioned. So the, there is a dedicated paper coming soon where we did all this control just to make sure how, when do you put the inhibitor, what to look for, and stuff like this. And um, I think the take home message is that you want to make sure that you don't get a, dish, a non physiological binding. So this is, a, this is something to control for. And the, it seems that also the timing. So for example, like we add this forest here, which is a modified nucleotide. So if you add this modified nucleotide too early in infection, the virus will not replicate very efficiently. So there is a special window where we can do the labeling. And if you want to see what will be the future for this, that instead of um, instead of using the forest issue and the, the transcription inhibitor, it would be only using a specific probe, but the specific probe has its own problem as well. Because it's, it, 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 we say it's a specific probe, but when you do the, the sequencing, it will not really be specific. And you will end up because you are not just capturing capturing the RNA, you are capturing the protein bound to the RNA, right? So, for example, if you get a little bit of contamination, but the, if it's massively bound to proteins, it will mask. You will have massive noise, which will mask the signal. And this is we have we, we also have done that, and we, we see that you get a lot of noise from these approaches. Um, so the way that is go forward, maybe to combine both. I think that would be maybe something uh, ideal. And that because now we are relying on the OWCT capture and that will only work for viruses that have fully embedded RNA. So for example, if you started to go for coronaviruses and stuff like this, they don't have fully embedded Zika, dinghy, they don't have fully embedded RNA. And then you need to rely on the probe method. But adding the probe method by itself, you will get noise. We know this. So if you add the inhibitor and the forest you, that will take you uh, very high in the specificity. And I think for now this is um, it works. So other than that, in the future, someone has to come with, with maybe a revolutionary idea to, to change that. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to interrupt. Sorry, uh, I, I had a follow up question actually uh, related to this. Uh, so uh, I think it's really cool that you could use this uh, 4SU uh, flavor uh, kind of uh, motif to do more specific uh, binding of your RNA uh, targets with your proteins. I'm actually really uh, just just curious from your point of view. Uh, I, I know it, it could also sound like it, you know it's contaminant junk, but from from my point of view, maybe if you can look at the proteins associated with those RNA in tandem, would that give you any interesting levels of information? This is me speaking, you know, from like an intact protein perspective. So if you can do like a say top down LCMS, separate out different forms of your RNA binding targets, is there any interest to know? exactly how these RNA associated, maybe the sites specifically, or, you know, in just what kind of um, stoichiometries these can exist in. I, I'm just curious if this is, is really powerful for what you're doing. Um, so let's see if I understand the question. So the idea that, yeah, so where it binds, for example, and how it binds to the RNA, in which form? 
Did that what you, that was your question? Or? Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, um, is it helpful maybe to get that information from like an intact perspective? Yeah. Like if you like analyze the RNA and the DNA, uh, sorry, the RNA and the protein at the same time. So if you just take mass spectrometry and look at both of them at the same time, does yeah. that give you access to something interesting? Yeah, absolutely, because there are different forms of the viral RNA. So for example, like you can get the hybrids when you have the plus strand and minus strand, that would be actively replication complexes. So that you make the RNA during the replication and still in the replication process, but also you can have during the translation, right? So that would only be the plus strand it went to the translation machine and that would be different complexes. So if there is a way that you can isolate these sub substructures, with, so basically you do the same, but I, that would be amazing. But I, I don't think we are here yet. But I, I, I asked this because, uh, you know, uh, something that, uh, you know, you probably know very well is the many, like the most common kind of cross-linking that I tend to see is the formaldehyde base yeah. uh, cross-linking. And, and that's, that does a good job of getting the RNA target with the protein. But as you mentioned in your talk, it can do a lot of non-specific targeting as well. So if you had a way to be very specific, I imagine if you could just kind of pull down the RNA motifs with that protein, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if an intact mass spectrometry kind of uh, approach to this might give you some new information so or a new new kind of idea of the, the kind of interactomes you can you can form. Yeah. Sensitivity of course uh, it becomes very relevant then no? so how down you can go in, in uh, if you count the RNA molecules per virus how many uh, cells the virus infects and how much you need then to do an index proteomics and um, this is something you probably and um, would need to work a lot very good cool. okay uh, but I have another follow-up question a little bit too well it's, it's still on the technical nature but I think it's fine we have proteomics group here um, so um, Quite a few people that are doing subcellular proteomics in eukaryotic cells, they have um, added um, new, new tricks to do that. And one of them is to, to move a little bit away sometimes from the purification of organelles and to use correlation analysis, all sorts of different correlation analysis to assign uh, proteins to a certain compartment. No? And this overcomes, of course, the difficulties of needing to break up the cells, to fix things, to purify them. Um, so, so, so is this something um, your field has been thinking about too? Have people, or have you, or have, have all of us tried that to work now with machine learning methods and many, many samples and try to assign the binding based on correlation analysis rather than a physical purification? So the idea that you want to develop an approach which would be uh, can be used to use for something new. So for example, like correlation analysis, that would depend that you have a previous knowledge about this protein, and most likely they will interact with this RNA because this RNA exists in this subcellular localization. But when you work with something, you want to develop an approach you can use for for SARS-CoV-2. It's a virus that you have no idea what what's happened with this virus, right? So the only thing that we know about SARS-CoV-2 is polyandelated RNA. Right, and that's that was enough for us. So, so then, so then you need to so you need to use you need to develop an approach which doesn't rely on a previous knowledge. Once you get the interactome of SARS-CoV-2, you can use the correlation analysis for what kind of protein it hijacked. For example, like we saw that there is enrichment for nuclear proteins, and then we did a subsequent experiment with some, with the fractionation, and this is coming, they were coming, and we see that there is actually migration from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, and it will point to the viral RNA. So, this is something that we work on right now. But before we start to do the correlation, we need to use an off bias approach, which doesn't rely on previous knowledge, to generate the data first, and then we do that. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Makes a lot of sense to me. And David, a question back to you. Um, uh, Harry and Sean have both asked in the chat. Um, to which extent um, is the, the cell align and the culture condition influencing your uh, glycosylation pattern? And let me add a little bit to this question. Could you describe a little bit um, which cell lines you actually use to produce your recombinant spike protein? And we are all curious about the quantities that you needed to do your intact protein analysis. These are great questions. So. Um, the data that I showed in those slides were actually done from uh, HEC 293 cells. So this was the this was commonly generated from HEC cells, uh, similar to a lot of things that uh, people have been currently working on. But it's a great question because um, if you look into the glycobiology, uh, you would expect that there would be differences between not only different cell lines, but from different uh, places where these cells might arise. So in, in the literature right now, there's sort of a, a, a 
a kind of a zoo of different sorts of uh, preparations of the COVID proteins ranging from hex cells, so uh, or even lung cells, or some people are using Vero cells to, to test trend infection models. And um, the underlying sort of molecular basis for all of this is that, yeah, I definitely expect, and a lot of people do expect, that there should be differences in the glycosylation depending on uh, the cell type and kind of how it's actually prepared. Uh, in the cases right now, actually in sort of the future studies I'm, I'm working on, I'm, I'm actually switching over to uh, so human, human small, wear, small airway epithelial cells, so something more closely reflecting to where the infections might occur uh, from, from SARS, just from the, the, the progenesis. And to answer the, this is this is hopefully going to reflect a little bit more of the of the COVID biology, but it really remains to be seen sort of what uh, the maybe the, the proper choice is. Uh, at the very least, a lot of the mammalian expressions seem to give very similar uh, glycan abundances for the most part, although this, the structures may not necessarily be the same. The sites have been relatively the same uniformly, which is a good thing. Uh, but to answer the follow-up and, and how much exactly do you really need to do this sort of thing? Uh, so it turns out uh, if you wanted to do this uh, sort of really well, the kind of concentrations I, I'd recommend for the most part are anywhere from one to 10 micromolar. So if you can uh, prepare solutions about that range, you should be okay. Uh, the, a quick rule of thumb I like to say is that basically if you can see the protein on the gel, you can see the protein in the mass spectrometer. And uh, for intact proteins, that's very true. So I would say um, you do need uh, a bit to, to get moving, but uh, it's not in like the, the milligram or grams level. I, it's still relatively in the microgram of protein level range, so long as you can prepare concentrated solutions and take advantage of sort of like nano uh, volumes, so sort of like uh, nano spray approaches, you can usually get a pretty good signal for intact analysis. So once you load such a big amount of protein uh, uh, on your machine and you do the high resolution or ultra high resolution scan, you actually should be able to see not only the oglycans, but, but you should actually see all of the modifications that are uh, on your protein. Can you comment a little bit on the things you have seen in addition to things that look like oglycans? Oh, right. Yeah, this is a great question. So um, although the focus at the time was, you know, mostly looking into the oak lichens, there, there's, a, there's a few other things actually that I did tend to notice, especially from the native data. Um, one thing is uh, I, there seems to be appear, what appears to me a lot of uh, redox uh, labile or redox uh, uh, specific uh, PTMs. I, I suspect there might be cystinylation of like the regional binding domain. And there's a, there's a good number of uh, of, of protein uh, molecular ions that exist in an acetylated form. Uh, so, so what I'm seeing tends to be N-terminal acetylation, uh, redox label modifications, but no signs of uh, you know other sorts of like uh, classic modifications like phospho and so forth. It, this this protein seems to be mostly just glycospecific. Um, but yeah, so I think if there is uh, other modifications that are potentially of interest. It definitely would be uh, better to look at this through a native point of view because uh, this this thing is actually really uh, tricky. The, a lot of these modifications don't always exist uh, uniformly. I, I and actually something that I've seen with this recent work is that some of these modifications tend to coexist with specific structural types, uh, and and that's very interesting from from just sort of a molecular point of view. Uh, but uh, it, it may it may hold some interesting things to see in the future. I, I would really love to do um, sort of a more comprehensive comparison with with other forms of this protein, especially now that we have all of these new variants emerging. I wonder if there's anything that these trends might be able to elucidate, um, especially when you start to look at it in combination with ACE2. Actually, some of these modifications, now that I think about it, um, may play some interesting roles um, as I'm looking into sort of the native association or the native binding of the regional binding domain with ACE2. So you can actually see during their uh, complex formation, which are sort of the dominant uh, molecular forms that coexist. So maybe there are some modifications that help to promote ACE2 association and some that may be deleterious. 
And and what's what's cool here is that with this intact protein approach, we can potentially start to look at that or illuminate some of those questions. So I think it's a very interesting thing to keep uh, keep an idea of moving forward. Thanks, that's great. So we have probably time for one more question each. So that means we have a good discussion. Ah, yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for David. So recently it was shown that all glycosylated as well. Do you know if if anyone? <laughs> um, yeah, I saw that work too. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carolyn Bertosi's group really showed something really interesting. It's like a new motif now that we can play with. It's under our nose all this time. Uh, I'm so, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Do you know if butter RNA can get glycosylated, or do you know if it can be predicted somehow? That's, That's really interesting. I, actually, you, you know what's funny is uh, when I was reading that paper, I, I, I was thinking about this briefly, but now that you mention it, especially after seeing your talk as well, that that's a very cool thing to think about because um, do specific RNA modifications influence uh, this, this sort of viral replication or even, even some of the viral modifications that you can achieve? That's really fascinating. In fact, actually, maybe that alludes to the thing I brought up with you, Whale. Uh, if you were to do intact mass spectrometry, where you do this for like uh, RNA crossing, if you can indeed do this uniformly and glycans maybe are like accessible, we, we can actually even start to answer some questions like that. Because uh, yes. then you could at least on both mm -hmm. of them, assuming that those are associated. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, there's really any good techniques right now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, to look at uh, epigenetic modifications aside from mass spectrometry for the most part. I mean, you can reach for the for the RNA with application. You like uh, pull down for something. You have a pull yeah, down. It, it's yeah, if you can definitely pull down at least the sugar motifs and then start to study those. Actually, that's really cool. I I, I like that. Uh, like, I really wonder if that's something because like we don't really know anything about that right now. It's sort of like in the frontier or like the the edge of what we know right now. That that would be really interesting. RNA modified glyco glyco RNA influencing uh, viral infection, viral function. Uh, th there's there's definitely a chance for that. David, we see you're excited. Like the final question, Joel, because time really, really flies away. And um, some of your RNA interact don't contain components of, of uh, stress channels, of P bodies, you know, of so uh, uh, dynamic structures, which not necessarily um, are, are as defined as we, we tend to know protein complex. So can you can you comment a little bit on those? Well, how do you see the interaction between the viral RNA and all these dynamic cellular structures that you just start to begin to understand? So, for example, like when you talk about stress granules, one of the things that the virus wants to do in infected cells is need to inhibit the formation of stress granules. So it's known that it's known to hijack a number of these stress granule components, and then it become reprogrammed for to do something for virus infection. It either helps in the replication itself. Because you will see also that they change localization going to the viral factories, and then it can be pre-programmed for replication or translation of viral RNA. There are several examples of this I can share as well. Sounds good. So lots of things that will need to be discovered. Great. So it's my pleasure now to thank both of you. And these were fantastic talks. We had great questions. Um, it was very nice to see the excitement in both of your faces flashing up when you started discussing. So hopefully you can bring this into the future. And what's left to me to bring it back to Tom. And I say thank for my side and see you at one of the future webinars again. Thanks, Marcus. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have a form for those requiring certificates of attendance, which is will be accessible for a few minutes after we wrap up. That's going to come shortly. Um, but before that, thank you again to our both speakers and our guest chair for the lively discussion. It certainly was indeed uh, nice to see, as Marcus said. Um, thank you also to everyone for coming along and to those committee members that are working away in the background to make this webinar possible. Um, we're going to be back in October for our session addressing the role of bioinformatics. And, and what that plays within proteomics. That's going to take place on the 8th of October in the usual place right here. Uh, I'm sure we'll see uh, a flyer about that shortly. Keep an eye on our website and social media for details on our first in-person meeting, which we're aiming to host in November. Uh, on the point of in-person meetings, the LBMS DG, that's the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion,